All right, looks like we're ready to get started. So our next presentation is from Dean Golich, and he is going to be um, presenting on a philosophical uh, look at performance modeling. Dean is the head performance physiologist at Carmichael Training Systems, and for the past 20 years, he has been pioneering the application of exercise physiology. He has personally coached over 70 national champions and a dozen world and Olympic champions, and uh, he continues to be at the forefront of endurance coaching. Dean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Training Peaks for allowing me to talk. Um, it's an interesting thing because this is the first time ever that I will give a, a general presentation, and I think that shows my age. And I was just talking to Joe. My first presentation was 20 years ago, and Joe and I presented at the same conference, uh, International Cycling. Um, symposium and I presented on well I think it was power measuring devices and VO2 max and lactate threshold and what I've learned since then and I'm going to try to show you um, and illustrate all the mistakes I've made over the last 20 years and the previous presenter said that coaches don't make mistakes that you just learn from them well I, I respectfully disagree because I've made plenty of them and the way that I look at that, I was at that conference thinking, why are all these older guys who have trained so many people and had so much success talking in generalities all the time? And why don't they just get down to the specific, how many watts does it take to succeed? What do you have to do? What is exactly, do you do 3 by 15 or 3 by 16? How are we going to do this? And so I presented like that. Now here I am 20 years later not presenting like that. So that's, if you get nothing else from this presentation, that's the summary. So first of all, we're going to talk about your bias, perception, and opinion. And a number of people have already talked about that. But we're, I'm going to illustrate it to you that very few of us have actual data and research to back up our opinions, which is kind of sad. Um, then we'll go into performance philosophy, and the point with that that I want to make is that it's a coaching philosophy that you're going to prescribe training. So what is the philosophy that you're going to use when you think someone is 1% away from winning a medal? What do you do when they're 4% away? What do you do when they're 10%? What do you do when they're not going to win a medal at all? And, and that's very important of how you look at it, your philosophical idea of how you go about training and coaching. And then we'll look at some model tools. And for this, one of the ideas that we had talked about with Training Peaks is I don't have anything on cycling or running or triathlon in here. This is all the other sports that I work with. Because you guys know generally all the tools, whether it's WKO or Training Peaks, all those are at an advanced level. But some of the things that we do in cycling and triathlon are not very good compared to other sports. So, you're going to see a little bit of NASCAR in here, a little bit of ice hockey, which you'll, you'll see the limitations once we go through some of those model tools. And the idea is to get you to think about it. I'm not here to tell you how to coach or train. I'm here to try to get you to think and develop your own philosophy. And hopefully I can give you examples to show you where the limitations that we all have with our bias and with our underdeveloped performance philosophy. And then we'll look at some tools. And so I'll get a little specific to this and how I've made a bunch of mistakes in the validity of what we've um, measured. And then I'm going to create your own performance team for you. So that will, at the end of this, yeah, so we'll talk about that. So one of the quotes here is, if we have data, let's look at data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. <laughs> so it's real important that. A lot, we can all sit around and talk. And if so, so if I have an Olympic champion and I have the opinion, everyone's like, well, OK, it must be good. But in reality, they may not have become Olympic champion because I, the way I trained them. So the idea is you want to have a good core of data that develops your philosophy so then you don't get lost. And I mean lost in coaching. So you're not, OK, I do 3 by 15, and now I do 3 by 20, and now you're going to win the Olympics. And now you've gotten down the road, and they're not winning. What do you do? And you got lost because you developed this whole philosophy around that lactate threshold training or whatever manipulation you did in training. 
So now I'm going to prove we don't know anything. So this is bias. So false beliefs plague both experienced professionals and less informed people. So I can stand up here with, say, 20 years of credentials, and my bias is just as strong as if we have a, a person in here who's coached for one year. We both have preconceived notions and opinions of what we have tried and the end result of how that has worked. So if I said, OK, everyone stands on your head, and two of you win an Olympic medal, then we all stand on our heads. And, and then we had a bias that that's what we're supposed to do. And so it's a big problem. And I could point out, and I, not to offend anyone, which I probably will do by the end of this. And you can ask anyone who knows me. <laughs> but whether it's gluten or compression socks or antioxidants, you have you developed a philosophy that if you did these things, they would attribute it to success. And when someone did win, because and they were doing those things, you probably weren't accurate in your philosophy. So you do that without your brain even knowing, and that's why I highlight that, because everyone will swear right here and be at the altar of whoever they believe in that they know this to be true, and it's just not so. So we're going to take a test. And I've taken this test so many times, trying to prove myself wrong each time, and I keep getting it wrong. So the bias is always towards positive evidence. You want to believe. So as a coach, I think it's pretty important that you're trying to go the opposite direction. And no one ever taught me this. And so I'd, I've done it wrong many times. And I wish I would have known about this. But it's a Watson selection, Watson selection test. So your task is to determine whether all cards with a vowel on one side, so in case you don't know, the vowel is the A, <laughs> and an even number on the other side. So that would be the four. So which cards do you turn over for your hypothesis? So we'll give you a minute, but to determine whether all cards with a vowel on one side have an even number on the other, which cards do you turn over to prove or disprove your hypothesis? It's an interesting, and I've given it to a lot of people. So if you chose the A and the 4, you're among the 90% of the people whose minds get boggled by this task. Because the A and the 4 are only the cards that would produce the information of a positive hypothesis. It doesn't tell you anything about all the cards. So the idea is to try to prove yourself wrong. So you would turn over the A and the 7. And the interesting thing about this test um, is that every time they give this test, it always goes to 90% of the people turn over the A and the 4. So if you are among the 10%, I mean, we, we should probably get you up here to finish this conversation or presentation because I didn't, I'm, I'm in the 90%. And I think a lot of us are. So the point is, is that when you need to try to not do this, and the way you try to not do this is don't uh, formulate your opinions too soon. So again, if 90% of the people fail to, to fail to understand the evidence required to truly prove the Watson selection test, which gets the same results every time, then fitness professionals, rehab professionals are basing their beliefs on how well a given corrective exercise or treatment works on incomplete and insufficient data. So just Again, we got to think about that. So we're all plagued with this, and we all have the bias for it. So now when we test and prove that we're actually 90% of us are wrong, we've got to make a formulation of how we can correct that. And like I said, the idea is you got to go slow. So you have to, when, whether I tell you it or, and that's the point of this. So going forward, you can believe or not believe what I have to say. Hopefully, I have the data to prove it. But even then, you'll create a bias and you'll create an opinion. You'll go forward tomorrow and you'll uh, have an intervention. And then you'll get a positive result. And you'll say, see, it's because of that intervention. But you have to be real careful. So whether it's tomorrow or a year from now, you should always come back and revisit that. So the action plan is don't formulate your opinions too soon. So now I'll prove that we're quite wrong again. So this is coach and player perception. And on the bottom here is what the intended exertion is going to be. And right here is what the rated perceived exertion from the athlete is. And this is soccer players. So 
we have the top one is perceived exertion. We have coach duration and athlete duration, what they thought it was. We have the coach's load, what they intended, and what the player's load, what they thought it was. And so you can see, obviously, it's all over the map. And so, the, for example, this person thought it was a 12, and the, it was a 7 as far as the athlete was concerned, as far as a rated perceived exertion. So the idea would be is that it would all be around a certain area right in the circle, somewhat similar to this, but still you get these outliers. And so again, this is on perceived exertion, this is on coaching duration, and then coaches load, they actually measure the load and your perception of it. So when I go out and I, I mean, it's incredible here, is that this right here, this person is 120 and 120 and look what an outlier they are. So the coach thought it was 120 and the athlete thought it was 120 minutes. But the rest of these people, in general, were not in a good trend of what you thought you were training them to do and their perception of what the training was. So, so now there's a lot of reasons for that. So you ask the question, or I ask the question, well, a more experienced athlete wouldn't do that or someone who's less experienced, so then they tested that. So now this is an under 17, so they said, okay, the first year, we have first year players, what is their perception? Well, the players always think it's way harder than the coach. Second year, the coach thinks it's harder than the player. But then when you go down to the duration and the load, it's still the same. So your perception of what's going on, but then when you actually measure it for the duration of minutes in your perception, and then also the load, then it goes back to the same thing. There's no, advan there's no advantage to even be more experienced in the discipline or in the load or the difference between the coach and the player. So as a coach, you have to account for all these things. So at some point, you have to have some hardwired mechanisms and data to make sure you're all on the same page or more communication. So now that we don't know what we're talking about <laughs> and we're biased and we think we do know what we're talking about, we have to develop a performance philosophy. And so this, uh, the, the idea here is to get you to think, when you go in to coach someone and you, they have their goals and you're going to try to help them achieve their goals, not your goals, their goals, how are you going to go about that and what is the philosophy? Do you just say, okay, here's the training program that I use on everybody. You're more experienced, you need a little more volume, you're less experienced. If you don't have a reference point, it's very difficult. So what's the worth? the worthwhile enhancement for a solo athlete. So you need the smallest worthwhile enhancement in a situation of evenly matched elite athletes. So in this case, we're going to use elite athletes because it's easy for math and it's easy to show you the differences. Um, and so I would encourage all of you to go and get this, download this. It's a, it's a PowerPoint presentation by Will Hopkins and it's more advanced. I'm just using three or four slides from it. But when you read the whole thing, you'll um, it'll be more illuminating. So if we race this race, say, and it's 100 meters, so we have um, this gentleman right here that wins, okay? Now if we race this race again, who do you think wins? So if the race is run again, each athlete has a good chance of winning because of the race to race variability. It's so small. So again, we're relating this to your philosophy of how you're going to coach these people. So, if you're going to coach this guy who wins, and you're like, well, he won, so I'm already doing the right thing. Everything's good. I don't have to do anything. But if we race it again, there's a race to race variability, and he's going to lose. But if it was the first time he raced him, and he lost, would you train them different than the time that he won the first time? So then we race it again, and a different guy wins. We race it again, and a different guy wins, and virtually, you're going to have a 25% success rate if they're all within a meter of each other in a 100 meter. So how many times have you seen them all come across the line? And they're virtually all together. So you have to account for your race to race variability. And again, why I'm showing the, you this is because when you set out to train the guy, if you train the guy who won the first time, you think, well, I got it. I've done it. I'm, I've, I've nailed this training. I'm the greatest coach in the world. And then they race again. And then they get the Olympics, or they get to their goal event, and they do worse. And so you have to account for this. And so I'll show you. And you don't have to get mired down in the statistics too much, but you need the enhancement in the training. So a lot of times what we say is that you have to train someone in such a way that even on a bad day they win. And 
that's a much different philosophy in coaching and training than it is if you think they've already succeeded and they've already won. And again, it, this, again, it doesn't matter. This is just a good example, but it doesn't matter if you're trying to set a PR or it's, it's a 10-hour Ironman or 11-hour, whatever the case may be, there's still a variability in your performance. And you have to account for that coefficient of variance. So the best, express, the best expression of this is the coefficient of variance. So a coefficient of variance is 1% means that an athlete varies from a race to race typically by 1 meter in 100, 1 tenth of a second in 10 seconds, and 1 second per 100 seconds. So now if there's no enhancement, so we race that race, you have a 25% chance you're going to get first, and you're going to 25% you're going to get fourth. So that's a big difference if you're at the Olympics. But again, I want to keep reiterating, it's a big difference how you train fourth place. If fourth place, he would have won, he had the same percent within the variance of success, you would be like, no, I'm gonna, we got to go back to the drawing board. We got to redo everything to get him to get a gold medal when he got fourth. Because you have to account for the variance. And it's the same thing. You would exactly have the same philosophy if he got first. Because you're like, man, everyone's within a meter of us. We have a 25% success rate. We're going to have to go back to the drawing board and account for the variation again, even though you won the race. So that's a big difference in how you're trying to, again, train that athlete. So 2% variance, we've gone from 25% to 75, over 75%. But the point is, is that look at the decrease in the fourth place chance. So now you may not win, because you're still only over 75%. There's a, what is that, 50% of the time I'm right all the time? But there's 75% chance that you're going to win, but there's also a chance you're going to get fourth place. But it's much, much more decreased with a 2% variance. And so this is derived data. This is not actual, but this is how you create these models. So 1% is just over 50%, and 0.3%, that's basically the noticeable change. So when you say, I produce 400 watts in my time trial, you're really saying I probably need to produce 416 to account for the day that I time trial to get a medal at 400. 400 to 416 is a big difference. So that 0.3 or 3 tenths of a coefficient of variance gives a top athlete one medal every 10 races or one extra medal every 10 races. Smallest important change in performance to aim and for research or for intended for elite athletes. So that's the 0.3%. But for the rest of us, it could be 4%. For me, it's probably 20. So 0.9%, 1.6, 2.5, 4, that all relates to 3, 5, 7, 9 medals per 10 races. So again, when you create your philosophy and you think you've already, got a, uh, you've already trained someone for a PR or for a medal or for whatever it is, you have to account for this difference in your philosophy. So what's the value and coefficient of variance for elite athletes? So here we are. So these are the different sports that Will Hopkins has put together. And so say it's mountain biking and you're 2.4% in difference, that's, that's a big difference in power. So then if that's for time, then you multiply that by two or three to get the coefficient of variance for power. So that just gives you an idea of what the differences are in different athletes, and they're not the same, or different sports are not the same for all sports and for all athletes. So we have bias. Now we have a philosophy that we have to look at with some data to really understand how far we're going to go or not go. So maybe the intervention of the previous is to take more rest days, because I think you would think something is very different if you want to get 400 watts, and you're like, wow, well, should I train them another day? You might rest them an extra day. So it could be on the rest side that you're going to take a big swing at changing your training when you know that they're only 25% successful to win. I mean, but again, you can relate this to PR. The more important part that I'd say is, say, if the person was not one meter behind but four meters behind, then they're 4%. So what is your expected outcome in training that you could expect to achieve 
in a year. You think you get 4% in a year? You think you get 10% in a year? So an elite athlete, you get maybe 0.3, maybe 1% if everything goes together. But for the rest of us, 4%, you could maybe expect 2% in a year. So that means you're telling this person who they performed their best day, the person who won performed their worst day, they were down by, say it's 30 seconds in a time trial. You're like, you're only 30 seconds behind. But in reality, with the coefficient of variance, they're 4% behind, which means they're two years behind making up 30 seconds. So, um, so now we're going to look at some technical tools and we're going to go to other sports. So this is purely on the coaching side that I want to illustrate. So the way that we do it on the, in the hockey side is we have video analysis guys and software. And so a guy will be on the bench or a coach on the bench. He has a video screen um, and he can look at that. He looks at live gameplay. He radios to the video guys. They take a clip. And then during, actually what's really neat about hockey is during the actual games and breaks and periods and while on the bench, they coach them the whole time on strategy, tactics, and so on. So I want you guys to look, the idea, the reason that I put hockey in here is just because of a coaching tool that they do so well. They do many things poorly, but they do the coaching side extremely well. So what happens is when this guy radios, he takes a clip of that last breakout, up ice, run, whatever it is, slap shot. And so they take that clip and then they can replay it. So then, then the coach comes in. And so then they put it up on the big screen. And the coach in this situation is sitting directly in front of me where I'm videoing this. And then over on the left-hand side, I don't know if everyone can see, but on the left-hand side in this area, they'll have all the clips for that particular player. So they'll bring him in. This is only after the first period of the game and say, you did this wrong, this right. Here's what we're going to do in response to their defense. Here's what we're going to do in response for the offense. And then it's replayed over and over. So this, again, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get across is try to think outside cycling you know, triathlon and whatever your discipline is running. Try to look at other sports. There's many successes, many other tools that you can use and develop um, that will make you a better coach and actually more analytical to get to rid of your bias and <laughs> some of the other things. Um, so then they coach immediately. So that was one player. The next one is he goes right up there, shows him this is just two defensive guys, and this is after the second period. And he's explaining how he wants to change the defense to those two players in particular in relationship to those two. So, and I mean, this is constant. So if someone said, hey, I'm gonna, you're going to go out running today, and I'm going to follow you with a video, and while you're running, I'm going to tell you exactly how you should do it, I mean, you would have people flipped out. But these guys, they're so used to it because you've, you, we've set a bar. We all have this bias of what you can and can't do. These guys are so used to it. They've been dealing with it since they're little and they think it's normal. So it's up to us as coaches to change the bias, right? So it's up to, hey, wait a second. I'm not trying to overcoach you. I'm just saying, here's your running stride. Here's your running rate. Here's what's going on. And over time, yeah, they may be stressed at first, but over time, now they're not stressed because it's normal and you developed it and you understand what you're trying to get across because every day that you don't do it is another day that you've delayed it, right? So if we're talking about 2% a year, maybe you could get 2.3% a year. Or you know, you've changed your philosophy, so now you're going to get 2.4% that year. Okay. So then what happens, this is pretty interesting, is that all those clips are downloaded and each one of those laptops is for each coach. So then after the game, we go to the airport, we get on the plane, and so we have our own plane, and each coach gets their laptop with, say your defensive coach, you get all the defensive players, just their numbers, and all their clips of every one of their shifts throughout the game. And if you're offensive, offensive. If you want uh, all power play, all breakout, I mean, these are all terms in hockey, but if you want all those things, you can section those off. 
Then as each player comes on, the video analysis guy hands them a laptop. So number 22 gets number 22's, um, it's an iPad, and then he has all his shifts of the whole game when he gets on the plane. And then he goes through each one of his shifts. So then the coach comes back, or they've made notes that says, hey, um, we, you look at this, don't look at that, we should have done this, we should have done that. So then, that's the coaching learning and feedback, because they find out what actually happened in the game. The game's pretty fast, so you don't necessarily see it when you're on the bench, but afterwards when you get your video, you go through. And then you actually have the scouting report of the next game, so you can go back through and decide if you want to change your scheme or strategy. So then, that's all uploaded. They get their iPad, they go through and look at it, and then back at our home rink, they have their own server and their own computers, so at any time, they can actually go through and look at it on their own and do their own self-learning as well. So now the coach, doesn't stand, the coach doesn't stand over him in this situation, and the coach doesn't stand over him in this situation. They go back through and visually look at it themselves. Where, how did I score that goal? Where was I? What were my teammates? So then they can communicate together. So in this situation, you have this guy standing over another guy who's just watching plays of himself. It's an interesting thing, so, but if you're, not, if you're not in team sports and everything, you don't quite understand it. So. What software do you get? Uh, it's, a, it's a proprietary software that they have. But th there's, there's all kinds of software companies that have this. So, so now we've optically tracked them all. And so this is just one player and where he skated in the first period. And so, the way it looks is that below average speed is kind of the orange. And I'm sorry, I'm ignoring everyone over here. But, and then red is the average speed, and maroon is above average, and then fast is basically in black. So again, you're going to look at it all. And the point that I want to make with these next three slides is, you don't always, you don't have to have a preconceived notion of what you're going to look at again. So you may see the data after the fact and then go, man, I never thought it was going to be like that. And so when we look at that, that's period one, this is period two, like why did you never go on that side of the ice? <laughs> and why did you skate a lot less here? Because in this situation, you had three high speed efforts, one there, one there, and one there. So you really didn't skate very fast and through, were you tired? Was this gameplay? Was this because of the way the defense was playing? The idea is that you're, as a, this is to just challenge your mind so that when we optically track one player, what were they doing? And when you track your athletes, whether it's for, so, so many times we look at the physiological basis, but there's also a coaching basis too. So if, when we looked at the, um, I think it was Robbie, when Robbie had the modeling versions of everything, there's a lot of variability, so you try to account for all those variables. But you may find something you weren't looking at, and then how do you coach them? So if he says, well, I'm sitting in the car, and really if we don't have a camera on them, we can't see what they're doing, at some point you've got to find that out so then you can coach them. You know, because sometimes, I mean, as I was telling Joe earlier, my dad would say there's three types of people, those who learn by education, those who learn by consequence, and those who never learn. So, and I don't know which one I am. So then speed, distance travel, and then we actually have the data, and that's more what you guys have seen in training peaks and so on. But, and when you see this, this is terrible. So first, we have the great coaching, we have all the feedback, we have the video, we have the gameplay, and then it's like you skated four kilometers, and you did it 20 times, and you averaged 20 kilometers an hour. That's what they came up with out of all that. So it's pretty bad. So again. So this is my last, so we went from hockey to NASCAR. So now when you're coaching and you have a, you're using some model tools, you can have two types of people. So this is an overlay of two cars that we've had. And they, the tactics is completely different. So the one car wants to, or one driver wants to drive always on the outside or upper end of the track. The other guy always wants to drive on the inside and that's his preferred way to drive but they both get the same lap time. But does that mean they get the same lap time after 20 laps? Do you wear out your equipment more and more as the time goes on? Do you try to change the driver's technique? So at some point, you're gonna tell the guy on the inside, yeah, when you went and qualified, you guys are the same speed. When we go back on data and we looked at corner entry and exit, you guys are the same speed. But now after 20 laps of being on the bottom, you've wore all your tires out 
and now you're slower than anything, so learn how to drive on the top. But that's a hard thing to do when you don't have the data. What would you have said? Well, we're the same speed. You didn't get the car set up for me. So when the athletes are like, well, you know, that climb isn't suited for me, or it was really hot today, or, you know, there's a bunch of different things in endurance sports that we're used to hearing, but we measure it. So you've got to, at some point, get some data to get away from it. So as much as we're not the NASCAR crowd, um, necessarily, I guess that's a bias too. Um, see? <laughs> There's a lot that goes into this and a lot of the analytics of how you look at that. So, so now we're going to go to validity of what you measure. So even the mafia needs an honest accountant. So I think you guys understand that. So if, now I'll tell you a family story. And this is a good one. And it took me, again, 20 years. I'm just learning. They say when you get to be 50 years old, that you're maxed out on everything that you can know and knowledge and that you haven't forgot it until 51. So I'm tapped out right now. This is as good as it gets. So this is a calibration and this is a dynamometer that I used legitimately 20 years ago and they still have it and they were just trying to calibrate some stuff at the Olympic Training Center and that's why I put it in there. Um, I grew up in Wyoming, in the fields of Wyoming. My brother's a laser physicist and my other brother is an analytical chemist. My dad doesn't have any education and we'd go down in the fields and we would do the irrigation and move the hoses and all this kind of stuff. And my one brother, who's a laser physicist, it quite frankly is the worst person to work with in your whole life because whatever he does, he does it the opposite way that you would intuitively do it or the other three of us would intuitively do it. So by the end of moving it after like 20 minutes or so and you're exhausted and it's in the hot sun, we would just start throwing rocks at him till he would leave and go back up to the house because we'd rather have no help than deal with him. So I know him as the person who's the worst person to work with. And so I would never ask him for anything because I know he doesn't know shit. <laughs> so even though he works on lasers, right? So. Fast forward 20 years now, I went to San Diego to visit him against my better judgment. And I was telling him, yeah, we got this electric motor and it builds up the static electricity. And the way it works is that then once it builds up static electricity to calibrate the SRMs and your power meters, because we're going to make sure they're valid, is that then you can only do three workloads at a time. So you do 100 watts, 125 watts, 150. Then you got to stop. You got to move it, dissipate the static electricity. And he's like, oh, well, I could fix that in like 10 seconds. I was like, so the, the summary to this whole deal is that you can learn, there's someone in this room that knows something that you don't know, even if it's your own brother that you don't like so much, and that you would have been convinced that he's done everything wrong his whole life. So the idea is to get these people and these experts together in your performance team, which we'll get to, because everyone can help you. So what happens here is that there's a way to dissipate this energy, and you don't just take it. So when you get a power meter, and it says 300 watts, it may not be 300 watts. So you need to make sure that that's accounted for, and you have the, the, val the valid measures, or you know someone, even if it's your brother, who can actually help calibrate these things. And you don't have to be the expert. You just got to find someone who is. So. So your recommendations are only as good as your analysis. Your analysis is only as good as your data, and your data is only as good as the measurement system. I, it's a real simple statement, but I guarantee everyone who walks out of here, I could go calibrate all their power meters, and they would be at least 1% error. So at least. Some of you would have 8%. So if you have five years of data, and you haven't calibrated, and it's not valid, then you've got five years of error which changes your performance philosophy when you thought someone was going to win and they didn't, or you thought they were fatigued when they weren't, or vice versa. So it's real important. I mean, it's only a couple slides, but it's real, it seems really simple. And there's a lot of smart people, including my brother, who can help you. <laughs> so now we're going to create a performance team. So we've got some bias. We've created a philosophy. We've used some tools, and we're going to make sure they're right. Hopefully, we understand that we can have a ton of resources. 
So there's all kinds of people that, and, and they don't have to be in front of you. I mean, I've got a lot of Twitter people that I stalk, which they probably, if they knew how much I stalked them, that they would be very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> So, but they're really smart people and they, it, they don't have to be in cycling or triathlon or running or any endurance sport. They can be a statistician for whatever. They can be, and, and I want to really make sure everyone understands that because so many times we only think it's valid if it's someone who has coached someone who's won a medal or they have a big club. You don't need those person, and, and generally those people are real busy. So it's better to go get a PhD student here at University of Colorado. And there's a guy here, his name is Roger Anoka, who you'll see his name later, but he's a neuromuscular physiologist. And I just, I just bother him on Twitter. What about this? What about that? No, that doesn't. But he spent his whole life on neuromuscular physiology, and in 10 cents, well, at 140 characters, he can tell me, no, Dean, it's probably better you don't weight train, because it's not going to do this for what you think it's going to do. OK, thanks. I don't need to go get a PhD in neuromuscular physiology. I need to move on with how I'm going to train somebody. So, and here's the papers, by the way, so you can read them at your leisure. So in sports science, when you're creating your performance team, you need to know what matters, you need to measure what matters, and you need to show that you changed it. So everyone says, yeah, we know, hey, you're an aerobic sport, it does this. Well, OK, so now do you know how to measure it? Yeah, I got a power meter, and I got a Garmin, I'm all set up. Now what? You have to show that you did an intervention, you had the philosophy, and that you changed it. So if you said, excluding bias, that I did 3 by 15, and I worked on my threshold, and now I can do 3 by 50. Well, is that at max? Is that during a race? Was your power meter calibrated? On and on and on. So this is, a, this is really important. It's simple. You just got to go slow. So first, you got to find the demands of the sport. So first, we're going to know what matters. We're going to say it's aerobic. Then we're going to measure it. We have an accurate power meter. And now we're going to do lactate threshold intervals, or we're going to work on our aerobic system because we have a physiologist friend who's at University of Colorado, and they said, these are the length of intervals that work on the aerobic system. So now I'm going to go out and I'm going to measure their races and get the demands of the sport. Do you got that, demands of the sport? Because <laughs> if you don't know that, then you're kind of just training, right? So now I'm going to create a performance team. And again, this has gotten, a, I just put this, this is arbitrary. You, could, you want all these people, and you want a million more. And they, some of them you want living next door to you, and some of them you don't care where they are. And you're going to do it on Twitter or Facebook or their blogs or their websites, and you're going to get all these people together in your own mind. Because we're an individual. I'm not creating a performance team for the Olympic Training Center. And when I work on those performance teams, so I'm on four right now, there's lots of problems. And we'll get to what some of those problems are. You will think as an individual you don't have the resources to create a great performance team. You have all the resources that you need, and you'll create a better performance team because you're the boss. Because you'll be able to change and adapt very quickly. But if I want a blood test tomorrow for one of my Olympic athletes, I've got to go through like 40 different hoops. It's better I just call my buddy down there and go, hey, can we get a prescription and get a blood test? And I need an iron profile. OK, done. That's tomorrow. Where the, if I have to do it at someone that's on the hockey team, I got to get the players' collective bargaining agreement signed, and I got to make sure that they're only taking blood from a NHL doctor, and blah 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 blah. So no bureaucracy, quick to change. So now, when we create this performance team, for us as individuals, when you communicate with each other. Once the consensus is met and says we need a blood test and we are going to test for iron and we understand that it's not serum iron, we want to go with ferritin of an indication of iron stores and we want to do that, then if you did have a group of friends, one person goes away and tries to find out why we're wrong. So this is a theory that was developed in the Israeli military with, when they come up with a, a strategic plan or a military operation once they have all agreed on it, one person goes away and tries to prove the group wrong. And I think that's a pretty valid strategy, even if you're trying to prove yourself wrong. So less expertise all the time is better than more expertise some of the time. You know, this is a gray area because you can get some really smart people that publish all their stuff and 
are willing to help or give you a one-line sentence. And so, but if you can, it's better to have a graduate student in statistics go through, you know, spend some time with you one day a week with all your papers and your questions to figure it out. Even if he's not the, you know, the tenured professor. Um, quick to measure, quick to change, that's what you're trying to develop. And you're, if you're gonna add to your team, um, you want to add someone closer to the athlete. So, so many times in the Olympic movement is when they add someone, it's because I don't want to do plane flights anymore, so I'm going to add an administrator. But it's better to add someone who's going to go out and motor pace someone or um, a massage therapist or whatever you deem is important. It's got to be closer to the athlete. As bureaucracy and teams and performance teams in general get bigger, they want to take away their administrative duties to make their life easier, not actually make it better for the athlete. So remember, you want to add closer to the athlete. Whatever stays around the athlete, that's where you get your biggest, I guess, bang for the buck. So then back to our model, and this is uh, really what Robbie was talking about, is these physical laws, you know, when you have physics and you have analytics, you have a, an analytical or a numerical model, and that helps us predict the usefulness, but it's like Andy Coggin says all the time, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so you don't have to be perfect, you just have to know you're going the right direction and that you didn't get lost in your performance team, how you created your model. Because I got all my buddies together, I consider them friends, even though I stalk them on Facebook or wherever, I've got their opinion on ferritin and what the levels of ferritin for a female who's 19 years old, who's doing you know, 200 miles a week and cycling. Now we've got that. Now how are we gonna take all those numbers and I'm gonna go to my buddy and he's gonna do some statistics on what their normal iron profiles are and we're gonna get the proof of that, inter <clears throat> excuse me, of that intervention and its performance. So in the end, as easy as, as maybe I'm being on some of this stuff, if you don't get the results, you're, you're, it doesn't matter anyways. So you still, whether you're coaching someone who wants to go 11 hours in an Ironman or, and they're just recre I, not recreational, but it, they're trying to achieve something that's very important to them. If you don't get the results, it doesn't matter. So you have to go back and reassess your whole models and all the people that are within the performance team if you're not getting the results. So the best measure of performance is performance. So then we have the science model points. So that's the bias and corruption, you know, that we talked about in ourselves and then the science side. It's hard to change the scientific paradigms. That's why you need these guys that are the PhDs in all these different fields because they'll tell you where the errors are and where the gray areas are. And it's, and I need it tomorrow. I don't need to wait till he publishes it two years from now. I need it tomorrow. And you can get it from them. They'll give you a good opinion. And it's, a, it's, it's better than your opinion. And uh, um, whether it's applicable to science if it's not on elite or is it done on elite and you need to apply it to people that aren't maybe elite athletes. Um, huge challenges in the small groups. You know, when you have an N of seven and you're trying to, uh, you know, adapt that to all Ironman athletes, it's a, it's a challenge. And then obviously when it comes to those things you want to measure, you don't want to, I feel like this is going to work. When someone says that, you just walk away and go find somebody else. <laughs> so, and this is my hockey slide. So culture and tradition and kind of my last story is that we went and toured the University of Notre Dame with the hockey team to look at a facility. And we're walking along and someone's like, hey, did someone lose a tooth? And they look down, they pick it up, and they're like, oh yeah, that's my tooth. That must have fallen out. And he grabbed it and he was gonna put it, and the trainer's like, stop, let me clean it first before you put it back in your mouth. He's like, oh, okay. He cleans it, puts it back in his mouth. So that's where culture and tradition is different. So <laughs> if you fight for a living in the NHL or you're used to getting your teeth knocked out or you have so many stitches, that's acceptable. That's no problem. If you're, it's acceptable to ride the Tour de France, do 21 days, that's, that's normal. But that culture and tradition will lift you up in some areas and hold you back in others. So you, as coaches, you have to eliminate that. 
So I sat at this boardroom table with everyone who was making more than at least $3 million a year. And they're like, Dean, listen, we can't change everything. I mean, I understand the nutrition's important and you know, measuring all this, but when we're in Buffalo and we play the game there, we eat Buffalo wings and we always have a couple cases of beer on the bus between there and the airplane. And I sat there, I couldn't comprehend it coming from our sport. And I was like, so you're telling me that you get your teeth knocked out and the shit beat out of you, and that's acceptable, but not having a beer after the game is a problem? <laughs> and buffalo wings? And the head coach is like, yeah, that doesn't make that much sense, but <laughs> we've always done it this way, and they've always played real good in Buffalo, so I, I don't know. So. It's, and it's the same in the military, and it's, the same in, and it's the same with us, by the way. So what's acceptable in cycling that, oh, you're supposed to do so many hours, and you're supposed to train so hard, and oh, if you have certain pain or you have a saddle sore now, you just go ahead and go forward with it. So we need to eliminate that from our culture and tradition. So again, it can make you tough, but on the other hand, it may be misguided. So make sure you account for that within your individual sport. Because when you see it in another sport, you'll be quick to identify it in that other sport and, and really accentuate what idiots they are when you do the exact same thing in your own personal life. So, and it doesn't matter how many resources you have if you don't know how to use them. So, I like that. So here's your performance team. So get your phones out and take a picture of this because <laughs> if you follow all these people, you don't have to do any research. And you don't have to, they'll give you their 140 characters. And, and they're not, the 140 characters may take you two days to figure out what they said. But it'll be worth it once you do. Because it could take you four years of a PhD before you understood it. So this is one, and then this is the last one. So I wanted to make sure you guys had, this is not my opinion, right? Because my opinion is just my opinion. This is everyone who's actually studied it. And, it. and this, I guess, will be online afterwards. So you'll be able to see it. Well, did everyone get that one? Can you go back for one? Yep. Can you get the slides, too? Yeah. A couple of I mean, but these are really smart people. And so you can learn a lot from all their blogs. And then you don't have to rely on opinion or local, um, I guess, authorities that maybe are going off of that bias. So you can try to eliminate that and then create the bias of your own. So that's my philosophy now, Joe. <laughs> After 20 years, yeah. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dean.